as we continue to step out into the new year talking about God's plan and purpose for us. Uh, We want to remember that Jesus made it clear to his disciples what he wanted them to do, and we are, in fact, his disciples today, so uh, the clarity that he spoke to them is the same clarity that he speaks to us today. In Matthew 28, we have the Great Commission. It said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, Jesus. Therefore, what? Go. Didn't deviate too much in the Gospel of Mark. He said, Go, again, go into all the world, preaching and teaching and baptizing. And then in Luke, through the book of Acts, which we just heard the scripture, you will receive power when the Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Go, go, and be my witness. And he said, first in Jerusalem, this sort of a recap from last week, and we determined that our Jerusalem were those things that were right around us. Those things that are exceedingly familiar to us. He said, start where you're planted. Start where you live. Start where you work. Start where, where, you, where you are and be my Witness. Now, what is a witness? A witness is someone who saw something and can testify to it. In the early church, those initial witnesses were those who uh, were alive during Jesus' life and ministry and who witnessed his life and ministry firsthand. Beyond that, it was those who heard the message and believed the message and thus became witnesses in the spirit of that same message that Jesus gave to those who were present. Go into your neighborhood. Go into your workplace. Go into your school and be my witness. Let people know, number one, that you believe in me, and number two, that they should as well. So we've got our Jerusalem down pretty pat. Our Judea and Samaria, on the other hand, gets a little fuzzy, depends on how you want to define it. Define it. But let's think of it today as anywhere else you might go that's still familiar to you. Okay? I didn't say comfortable to you, but I said familiar to you. Once you've left home and you've gone somewhere else, that now is your Judea and your Samaria. Think somewhere you can drive. All right? We had a a group of jump ropers down in Baton Rouge in New Orleans. I think you all went to the French Quarter. In New Orleans, didn't you? Okay, was that very different? Yes. Yes. But the people still mostly spoke English, right? Okay, they looked like you. They dressed like you. That is a a Judea or Samaria, the New Orleans French Quarter. Some of you say, no, that's the outermost bounds of the earth, especially if you go after dark. Okay, but they went during the daytime, so it was still Judea or Samaria. Florida. A lot of you vacation in Florida or somewhere else on the coast, Gulf Coast, East Coast. It's not somewhere you all are, you are always there, but you are familiar with it. It's a Judea or Samaria type of place for you. Okay? You don't live there, you don't work there. You you don't stay there, but you may frequent there. Therefore, that becomes your Judea or Samaria. Remember, Judea was the region that Jerusalem was in. Okay? Middletown is in Jefferson County. 
So if Middletown's our, our Judea, we could think of maybe Jefferson County as, uh, if Middletown's our Jerusalem, we could think of Judea maybe as our Jefferson County, as one example. Samaria was a region north of Judea, but still somewhat familiar. There's a little map for you to see. You can see Jerusalem in the, right in the middle of Judea by Bethlehem, and Samaria was just to the north. But it was south of Galilee, and Galilee was where Jesus was from, that region. Okay? So when Jesus is preaching to the disciples about their Judea and Samaria... He was talking about those other places we have gone to that we don't call home but are still places we go and frequent. And he says you're not exempt from sharing the gospel in these places either. See, a lot of people want to go on vacation and say, well, I'm away. I'm going to let my hair down. Okay? And I'm going to act like I don't act when I'm home, and I'm going to do things that I don't do when I'm home. Well, I don't think that's what Jesus wants, unless you're talking mini-golf, okay? We don't have really great mini-golf around here. Those of you who frequent Gatlinburg know that Hillbilly Golf burnt down. That was one of our favorite places to play mini-golf in Gatlinburg. Many, how many of you played hillbilly golf before in Gatlinburg? Yeah, okay, all right. Got a few hands. I let my hair down when I play mini golf. <laughs> See, but far too many of us, when we get away, we want to be somebody else. And we want to do the things that we're afraid to do when we're home. Not because they're exciting and daring, but because they're wrong. And we know it. But it's the only time we get to do wrong is when we're away. Well, I remember one time we were driving south somewhere. We stopped at a rest stop in Huntsville, Alabama. And who did we run into but the Seacrest? I could have been, had doing wrong on my mind in Huntsville rest stop. And Casey said, my gosh, there's our pastor doing wrong. (laughs) See, but I I don't try to do right because Casey might be hiding somewhere in a foreign state to, to see me. But because anybody there can see me. Any person there, whether I know them or not, need to see from me the example of Christ. that they might believe. Even at rest stops in other states or or chalets in Gatlinburg or hotels along the boardwalk at the beach or grandma's house, which really don't consider a vacation. You've got to be Jesus. Jesus. As I said, a little bit more definition of what our Judea and Samaria might be. Samaria was about 42 miles north of Jerusalem. It was a several days walk. So let's think of a couple days drive. It doesn't matter where you go. Jerusalem, Judea, or Samaria... God wants you to be a witness for Him. That's all He asks of you, is to be my witness. Be be 
my arms and my legs and my voice and my heart and my love and my forgiveness and my compassion wherever you go. But we sit here and, and, and we hear these things and they go in one ear and out the other and we go about our tasks on Monday and Tuesday and we're just the same. We're hidden and we're cloistered and we're private about our faith. If somebody asks me, I'll tell them. Well, I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. You know, there's so many different cultures out today. I don't even know how to witness to somebody from Somalia or Afghanistan or, or this nation or, or New York City or Los Angeles, California. I wouldn't know how to go about it. So I'm just going to stay quiet. And Jesus weeps. Because a quiet Christian is an ineffective Christian. And I'm not just talking verbally quiet. I'm not just talking your mouth. I'm talking your actions and your mannerisms and your livelihood, everything about you. We can't be quiet anymore. It is breaking God's heart as we are silent across the globe. Islam believes that um, Allah will eventually pick those destined for paradise and condemn those not destined for paradise simply because of his choice and those who follow teachings of Muhammad. In Eastern religions, who believe in reincarnation, well, you just get another try. Okay? You messed it up this time, they'll send you back again. See if you can get it right. And after a thousand lifetimes, maybe you get it right enough that you get to go to this special place of joining together with all those other spirits who got it right. Judaism believes that that we are born this way. We are born the children of God. And as our birthright to be favored by Him. But if you look at the core of Christianity, what you find are men and women who are broken and battered from all of these different life uh, paths and, and faith paths who came to believe that Jesus Christ died for their sins. That they might have life everlasting. That he was the perfect sacrifice. And that God doesn't play one in and one out. And it's not about a birthright. And it's not about a second chance or a third chance or a fourth chance. It's about one chance to simply believe. But how can they believe? How can they know if you don't go. How will they hear if not for you? They won't. And I'm not being dramatic and I'm not trying to... to, um, I'm I'm not being dramatic here. I'm being honest. There are people that will come across your life that only you can touch.
And if you choose in your silence and in your inaction not to share Jesus with them, they may never hear the gospel in their lifetime. By here, I mean heart here, not ear here. Across the United States, in our Jerusalem, in our Judeas, in our Samarias, okay, all they have to do is, is hit seek on their radio and they will hear the gospel with their ears through preachers and singers. They can turn on their television and move through their channels and they can hear the gospel with their ears. But there is a point in time in each person's life, I believe, where their heart is ready to hear. And you might be that person that God has on that path to encounter them. But if you... Like most Christians, simply say, no, my, my faith is personal, it's quiet, it's calm, I don't share it unless I'm asked. No one will know, and it's better for everybody that way. And that person may never know. Heaven's a wonderful place, but the way that I'm built, I believe that there is sort of a pre-heaven. I'm not talking purgatory or anything like that. I'm talking about walking up to the gate. Somewhere along that line, Larry was telling me about the security line, TSA lines at the airport. I, I think we might have to go through a TSA line before we get into heaven. And along that line, you know, the book of life opens up whether you have an expired driver's license or not. And they search for your name and say, oh yeah, you're you're on the list. Continue in the line. You know, but there's another book that the Bible talks about that we hardly ever talk about because we just don't understand how that's going to work. And it's called the book of works. And it's in your Bible. It's in every one of your Bibles. And it says the book of works is open. And in that book of works, your life is laid bare somewhere in that TSA line in heaven. And you are held accountable at that moment for what you did and what you didn't do. Now remember, you, you already got approved. Okay, you're going to get on the flight. You're going to heaven. But I believe that there's this moment of of judgment. Judgment. Well, I don't care if it's it's Peter or Gabriel or, or Papa Smith that's there with the book. They look at that and they'll go, John, you know what's in here? This isn't good. This is a mess. You know how many times that you had an opportunity to share the gospel and you didn't? I know. (laughs) It's right here. 7,637 times, John. Do you you know how many dirty looks you gave to drivers on the highway? 87,964. Do you know how many times you turned a curse word into a non-curse word and said it anyway? Meaning the curse word in your heart? You are a mess. And then, and and I know I'm weird, okay? And I know that the way I think of things is, is probably not, don't worry, it's probably not totally accurate, okay? But it's the way I think. And then right past the book of works, is Jesus. He says, Wilma, don't worry about it. I got you. And he'll take that page out of the book of works and he'll tear it up and he'll say, 
I paid the price for this mess. Come on in. I am a holy mess. So are you. But there are going to be people who won't be standing in that line. Possibly because I'm a holy mess. And I want that number to be as low as possible when I get there. Therefore, in your Jerusalem and your Judea and your Samaria, remember you are his witness and you are to be an active, verbal, vocal, physical witness for Jesus Christ. That others might hear the gospel, not only with their ears, but also with their heart. Now, I'll ask you to forgive me for my imagery of heaven. Because like I, I said, it's, it's probably not right. But I'm a visual thinker, so I make pictures in my head. You know, but it's going to be something like that. And the book of works is real. And you have a responsibility to be a witness for Jesus. Every place you go that is familiar. Next week, we're going to talk about the outermost bounds of the earth. And we're going to talk about the places that most of us will never go. But how we still need to be open to going young or old alike, for a week trip or a lifetime to a place that is unfamiliar and scary and possibly dangerous. But if God calls us to go, we need to go. But we can't get hung up on the mission call because we're all called to missions Right where we are. And we'll talk about that vocational call next week. But today I want you to leave. And I want you to be Jesus to everyone you come across. That they might know how much he loves them. you are not a member of Woodland, but you'd like to become a part of our community of faith here, say, you know what? That pastor guy might have some crazy dreams, but I want to be a part of that. Or, I love these people. They're as weird as I am. I want to be a part of that. I encourage you to come forward and just simply make that clear to the community of faith here. We'll accept you in with open arms. Maybe, just maybe, you've, you've walked away from Jesus for a little while. And you've lived like the world lives. And Jesus says, it's time to come back. There's no better time than the now. to come back to Jesus. However he might call, whatever he might say, simply be faithful and obey as we say.